sorry about that, thank you for your patience again. Um, so this next session is um, going to be a panel session, so I'm going to invite four very, very special guests of mine to come up and do an open conversation about Vitiligo, talking about their past experiences, talking about their present, talking about the things that have been going on for them for the past few months and years. So can I please welcome to the stage Jyoti. Where are you, Jyoti? Hi. Up you come. Alec and James. And hopefully Shankar's here. Shankar, excellent, up you come. Sorry, it's a bit of a tight stage, a bit of a tight squeeze, so we can just get really comfortable and start hugging at some point. It's a bit of a tight squeeze, so take a seat. <laughs> so I guess so for me, when I, when I approach these four wonderful, wonderful people, for me, what lives at the heart of vitiligo is talking to the people that actually have the condition, which is why this section or this panel was really important to me. Um, one of the things that I struggled with growing up is knowing people with the condition. So now that we have things such as social media um, and we can connect with people, it makes such a big difference to know that that community is there and that you can connect with people from people that live in the UK to people that live across the globe. So, um, I don't want to introduce them too much because I want them to share their stories. They've got some amazing stories that I know that they can share with you because they have pretty much lived the past few years, past few months in the public eye. So, I'm just going to give like a bit of a brief intro. So, we've got Jyoti here. Um, she starred in um, the BBC Free series, Misfits Like Us, which was um, out earlier this year that you might have seen on BBC Three. We've got Alec King here international model um, and he's doing incredibly well walking the runway and doing various um, you know um, various sort of me, uh, media related um, initiatives we've got the lovely James Stewart here our youngest our youngest member here probably um, who was photographed by Brock Elbank um, you've probably very very familiar with some of the work that he does and then we have Shankar on the end who was recently on the front cover of a magazine and was voted um, one of the best looking male vitiligo persons so he's a hot guy he's a hot guy so one second so i guess um with this session it's just going to be a very very open talk um, we'll welcome some questions but it'll be just me asking some questions just having a really really open conversation about vitiligo so what i'll do is i'll just pass the mic along okay mm -hmm. so um we'll just start from the very very top or the very beginning so I developed vitiligo when I was two years old. Um, I don't remember my first patch. Um, I was far too young to recognise that I had the condition. And I've always felt like anybody that's developed the condition at a later stage in life, that it must be quite difficult for them because they're watching their skin change. I didn't watch my skin change. I was far, far too young to understand what was happening to me. So I guess my first question is, is how old were each of you when you developed the condition and how did it make you feel as you watched your skin change in colour? Um, so I was, I was 21 years old and... Um, I was studying Spanish, like it, it was part of my degree living in, in, in the south of Spain. And I'd come back from my year abroad and I noticed this white spot on the left of my arm. Now, when you're 21, you're in the prime time of your life. Um, I didn't have any worries, I didn't have any concerns. I had a very supportive um, family. Um, I was very happy and very confident as, as doing what I loved, which was like speaking Spanish and living in Spain. And then I came back and I had this white spot and this spot spread and spread and spread, Natalie. It just wouldn't stop. And the more I stressed out about it, the more I became anxious and really worried about this spot, the, the more it was just kind of taking over. Um, so that, that, those were the initial days. Um, so I was, my first early memory of it, I was six years old. Um, I was on a family holiday in Tenerife. And I remember, Bless my mum, she's here. Um, I remember um, I was at a, a pool um, in Tenerife and I just got these like white lines along my fingers. And the immediate like thought was, did I touch bleach or something? I was a young child, I was at the pool just on holiday. Um, but there wasn't too much thought about it because I wasn't in pain. There was no physical detriment to myself. When I was six, I didn't want to keep applying sun cream and all this, so I was just, running around with my mum trying to chase after me to cover whatever was on. So we then got back here and 
then the medical side obviously proceeded, but yeah, I was six years old in Tenerife. <laughs> Um, I first got vitiligo when I was in year seven, two years ago. I was 11 years old and it first came up on my neck, on the left hand side of it. And it was quite hard because it was the start of secondary school and everyone's fighting about to be the most popular. And having a different like face and neck to everyone else makes it quite hard. And I personally thought I'd done something wrong to deserve this, but now, two years on, it's made me a better person. Yeah. Um, with myself, I developed it when I was about 15 years old, uh, and it only started as like a little white circle on my chest. Now, with that, I generally thought, oh my God, like, I'm not washing myself properly here. So I was like down in that links, like proper scrubbing, but nothing, you know, it would go. And if anything, it grew. Uh, so one day, I was just in the sister room, it was uh, summertime, uh, just had my shorts on, and my grandma was round, uh, and she goes, like, oh, what, like, what's that on your chest? Um, and she goes, you need to go to the doctor. And I was like, no, nope. I, like, I guess, as any young boy, you sort of don't realise, you know, when things go wrong, you sort of don't really look for help. Um, and yeah, it progressed to going to the doctors, and then finally finding out what it was, uh, it completely changed my life purely because I'm a GCSEs and it, it completely then flared up. Uh, so it just on oh, my chest, then my eye, then my back, my leg, and then obviously numerous parts around the body. Yeah, so I guess it's, it's quite amazing how everybody's first patch develops and where it develops. Um, as you said, yours was on holiday um, and we all know the sun can obviously you know, bring on vitiligo. For me, it, I, I don't know how it developed, it just came with numbers too. So it's really interesting how everybody's story, everybody's first patch is very different to everybody else's. So I guess um, one of the next things that I wanted to ask is about diagnosis. So I know diagnosis can be quite difficult. Um, it's quite difficult to get that initial diagnosis. When I, when I got it when I was two, and then we're talking, you know, over 30 years ago, um, you wouldn't think it, but you know, um, I didn't get diagnosed straight away. Um, my mum took me to the doctors, asked, you know, asked what this white patch on my hand was. The doctor didn't know, just told my mum to keep an eye on it and then sent me on my merry way. I was then taken back to the doctors um, and it was then that they said, well, she might have vitiligo. You might need to take her to see a dermatologist. So there's always this uncertainty. It's always very, very difficult to diagnose um, vitiligo. But I do think that's changed now um, as, we, as we get more awareness of the condition. So I guess my next question is, was you diagnosed? straight away did you go to the doctors once or did you have to go twice to kind of force to get you know to understand what it was that was happening to your skin Gosh, Natalie, when you ask that question like I just get this blur and I just feel so emotional and I've been so strong um, for the last year but I just feel really emotional when I think about that because when I um, found that spot I remember like talking to my mum my mum's a nurse my family are like from a medical background and my, my parents just couldn't understand what, what this was, you know, like no one in the family's got it. No one, like they weren't really sure what it was. Like this is 20 years ago. There wasn't a lot about vitiligo in the media. There was social media. And like even my parents that like, work in the hospitals, they were like, you know, they, they, they were quite unaware about what this condition was. And because it was a tiny spot as well, everyone was quite unsure. I did go to the GP and they, they did diagnose it as um, vitiligo. And, and then straight after that, I started having having poo for treatment at King's College. Um, so I was diagnosed pretty much straight away. But there was a lot of uncertainty um, about it because, you know, it was just a spot and we were like, you know, maybe it was from the sun, maybe it was from sun exposure in Spain, you know, maybe it was a climate, maybe it was food, you know, there was a lot of conversation at home about what it could be, but the GP did diagnose it as vitiligo. So I'm a totally relate, like it was the biggest blur the whole medical side of it. Um, but I, when I came back off holiday, um, obviously my, mum, my mum's also a nurse, um, she brought me to the doctors and they didn't really know what it was because it didn't hurt. They don't really know why it came about. I seemed fine, let the boy live. That's how it was kind of like left. And then slowly it went on another finger and another finger and another finger and obviously my mother's looking at me like, what's going on? Like, why, why is this happening? So we go again, and I'm not lucky enough to live in a big city anymore. I do now, I live in London, but I lived in a rural countryside town. 
Um, so it meant there was a lot of times when I'd go to my local hospital, they'd send me away, didn't know what was going on, I'd be put on a steroid cream, which would then not get rid of the vitiligo, but balloon my face. And now this was a process up to like maybe 10 years old. So I was doing it for four or five years. And then there was protopic creams. And then I had UV light treatment, which then developed cancer spots. So it was like, do we go through the process of removing the vitiligo, but then giving the child a cancer? So that was all a sort of conversation. I think that's how it got to the point where I'm at now. Um, but the whole process of it was very, very long. I'm sure you can all kind of relate to it that the initial stages are also the most confusing. And I don't think I really heard that I'd been diagnosed with vitiligo until my early teens. I don't think it was really told about that. But once I did, then obviously I knew societies like yourself and then you can just grow from there. But yeah. Um, it had been about a month after I got it or two and it started spreading across my forehead. So we went to the doctors to see what it might be. And obviously it's an immune thing. And my mum has MS, so they said it might be that and we thought that. And I have a heart problem. So we, the doctor and our family thought it might be linked to that. So about after three months of having it, it had spread it all over my neck, started getting it more all over my body. And I think finally we had researched for those three months what well, it might be all over the internet. And finally we found vitiligo and we mentioned it to the GP and he said it might probably be that. And they've tried um, all different types of stuff, light therapy, but we didn't really want to do that or tablets or cream, but nothing really worked. And then finally it's, it was about two years, just last June, um, we found Brock and I went back to the GP for something else recently and it made me feel quite good where they went, you missed your last appointment and I went, I don't want to get rid of it anymore and it makes me feel a lot better having it standing out. Um, with myself, uh, when I went to the doctors, they didn't uh, know what it was. Um, so they gave me a uh, protopic cream and they gave me two doses. One was uh, quite weak and then went through a second phase, which was stronger. Now with that, I then they said to me, I've got vitiligo and they've got a, a, a therapy of like UV light, I think, as you mentioned as well. So around that time, I started uh, college um, and the, uh, the host, St. Thomas's Hospital, I believe I went to, um, it was really costly. I'd have to go twice a week. It cost me about sixteen pounds a time just to be in this like sunbed machine for like ten seconds or then fifteen seconds. But unfortunately, uh, after about a year, uh, th there wasn't any response, uh, which is quite sad. Um, but my my family's like background's Indian, uh, and my dad went to India and he I don't know how, but he came back with all these like tablets, which I did not want to try, but. Uh, I don't know if it's a culture thing really, but um, so there was that like that way. My mum took me to Germany to see, I, I actually don't know what they're called, but it was someone who would uh, like, ask me loads of questions. And I don't know if uh, your seven chakras, something like that, and how like one of my chakras weren't right. Now again, I don't know if it's because of my culture, but we tried all these methods uh, and obviously none of them were successful at the time. Um, but yeah, the beauty of it, like you said as well, is it's the point of which you realise, you know, I don't I don't need to do this anymore. Yeah. I was, um, there's something that I want to add as well because I did all of these. I was so desperate um, to cure my skin. I was so desperate to turn brown and I did a private steroid uh, treatment which worked. Now, before I fell pregnant with my daughter, I had turned brown again and I was on top of the world. So this is when I was um, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 32 and I was on top form. I had bloated quite a lot because I was on the steroids, but it worked. I was wearing sleeveless clothing, so my skin had gone brown. But then I fell pregnant with my daughter and the vitiligo started to come back. And I think it's a really important message because there are treatments out there and there are people out there who will do, you know, um, the private doctors who, who worked on me. Um, and um, 
I, because I had turned brown, I was so convinced that there was a cure for vitiligo. But I wasn't mentally in that space where I thought, you know, I'm ready to accept this. I wanted to fight it. I wanted to be brown again. And because I had seen the results, I was convinced that there was a treatment. And then when I fell pregnant again with my son, I'd said to my husband, I can't do it anymore. I'm exhausted. I'm drained. The vitiligo's come back. And I just kind of felt so lost. I thought, there isn't a cure for vitiligo. You know, you're on top form and you think there is something out there. And then you realise... It, it, it that you know that there isn't so i mean like like everybody else i tried everything everything under the sun protopic creams and 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 steroids yeah i really resonate with that so um <laughs> i must have started going to hospital when i was about three years old and i literally felt like it was my second nursery i was always in the hospital always in that play area playing with the building blocks until the dermatologist called me in and looked at my skin again. Um, so I spent a lot of years in treatment. Um, I mostly done the topical steroid creams. Um, and it worked on my face, but it could just never work on my body. Um, I then, at about 12 years old, decided that I'd had enough. I'd had enough of going to hospital. I just wanted to be an ordinary child that went to school. I didn't want to be in out of hospital. So I left it. I left it for years and years and years. And then, I don't know why, but in my on my 30th birthday, um, which is like 20 years later, I thought, you know, what, I'm going to give it one more try. I'm going to give it one more try. If it doesn't work, so be it. But if it does, fantastic. So I tried UVB um, light treatment and it was intense, like um, um, Alex said. Uh, I'd go twice a week. Um, I'd go six o'clock in the morning um, before work and I started work at 8.30 and I'd have this treatment. I'd be in a box, a tanning booth um, for like two minutes having radiation just you know put over my body and I became obsessed with it I became so obsessed I didn't want to go on holiday I didn't want to I didn't want to miss an, uh, miss an appointment because I thought if I miss an appointment then you know it's going to affect my skin miraculously it started working at an alarming rate after about four months my skin started to heal I was getting my brown or my natural skin back. Um, and then by the end of the 12 months, I'd done a 12 month cycle, um, I had probably developed probably about 50% of my skin back. Um, and when I look at photos now of the person that I was before that treatment, I look incredibly white. And for the first time four years ago, I went on the beach. I'd never been on the beach before and wore a bikini. And I'd been on the beach, I started to wear shorts, I started to wear short sleeve t-shirts and it made a massive difference to my life. I still have vitiligo, very vibrantly on my hands, I've still got it on my legs, but the beauty of it is, is that I can now go out and know that I've got it on my legs and I just don't care and that is what is incredibly important to me. So I guess this leads quite nicely into my next question which was about um, how we get vitiligo. So there's lots of different reasons, it could be due to stress, it could be brought on because of pregnancy, it could be brought on because of the sun. Um, it could be hereditary. I don't have anybody in my family with the condition as far as I'm aware. So my next question was, is do you have any family members with the condition that maybe makes you connect, connect yourself to the fact that you, you now have it? Um, I don't have any family members um, and I did explore. And I remember when I, when I first got diagnosed with it, I would go to like family functions and stare at people, you know, l looking if anyone's got it and staring at them. Because um, I was very conscious about, you know, if anyone had it in, um, in the family. But no, nobody does have it in the family. Um, so um, the only reason that I could bring it down to that I could actually, you know, I sort of self-diagnose myself in terms of what I thought the cause was. And I think it was anxiety and stress um, during my degree. I think it was that. And also maybe, um, uh, I think that exacerbated it really. Um, so initially when I got diagnosed, none of my, we didn't think any of my family had it, um, but it was actually maybe about a year ago, it's about at the same time we filmed Misfits, and I was sitting in the lounge with my mum, and my mum leaned with her neck like this, and I was like, mum, what's that on your neck? And she's like, oh, I've always had this. I was like, that looks a lot like vitiligo. And we didn't really say anything else, it was nowhere else. And then maybe a month later, we went to my grandma's house, and my grandma did the same thing with her shoulder, and it's like, grandma, you've got like these patches and I w there was like a attachment to it that it came from the darker side of my family because um, I'm not in contact with them I don't see them um, but I'm in touch with my mother's side of the family so I just associated it that it had come from there because I hadn't seen it in them and then recently we found out that they might um, but yeah that's my kind of only touch with it with my family um. 
to be honest, I have no clue. Um, I only know the people that are around me the most. I haven't seen them with vitiligo. They may not even realise. Um, the only thing that I may know is my heart problem and my mum with MS. But I don't think they'll be very linked. I don't know what really causes it. I didn't in year seven. I'd had sort of anxiety in year six with bullying. I now, from basically when I first got it, have serious anxiety. I've been in and out with school trying to get part-time timetables. But I think anxiety probably made it worse for me because it spreaded when I got more self-conscious about it, when people would bully me about it. But I have really no clue, to be honest. Um, with myself, I, no one in my family that I know uh, has it at all. I know, like, when I found out I had it, my mum and my dad were on the phone just checking if their brothers or sisters have it and even if, you know, there's any correlation at all. Um, so, yeah, no connection with family. Uh, but definitely stress. Stress does trigger it, um, I found. Uh, and like I said before, like, with my GCSEs, I, I could feel it. So anytime, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but with your vitiligo, when I'm really stressed, it, it, I can feel it. And it. Not like a burning, but you're conscious that it's there. Uh, not like now when it's like absolutely normal and I don't know why that is um, but yeah I mean I can't really more I can't really add more to that really it's just stress has probably been the main thing where it's flared up for me can I just add something quick yeah. so I notice with my vitiligo that when I'm s well, when I was in stressful situations especially academic situations so exams tests or I've had a job interview or something like that I would notice that my skin would I understand what you mean, like it's very present, but it doesn't burn, it's not there. Um, and then maybe two weeks after the event that would have stressed me out, I noticed that my vitiligo flares more. Um, and now I'm in the space of that, I'm not in, I'm at university, but I'm not in the sense that it's stressful because I'm actually enjoying what I do, I love what I do. But back when I have to do triple algebra and my head's frying and I'm like, oh, okay, this is, this is my education on the line. It's a very intense situation. And then I've noticed that my skin changes, but as of recent, so I've lived in London for a year and I've been out of like core education for about two years. My skin hasn't changed. It hasn't moved. It's still there. It hasn't disappeared, but the parts that were there are still there, but there's no additional bits. I, it's almost like you, I could track where my skin was going when I was really stressed. It would change every single day. But now it's at a very stagnant point. And I think that's also because of like the methods I use. Like I do meditate, I do relax. I live a more relaxed life. I live a more pure life for myself. And I think that's also something that's really helped me along this way. Brilliant, thank you. So I guess we can move on to social media. So I think for a lot of people, especially in this day and age, social media has made a massive impact on a lot of people's lives because, as I said before, it enables you to connect with people that also have the condition. Um, one of the things that I found a problem growing up is I thought I was the only person in the entire world that had vitiligo because I didn't see anybody with it. Um, and now you have Facebook, you've got Twitter, you've got Instagram, and everybody's sharing their photos on the beach and, you know, sharing their photos and showing their skin off, which is incredibly positive. So I guess my next question is, is how do you find social media? What has social media done for you and how has it helped you accept your skin? What has been your experiences with it? I have to be really honest, I only ever used um, Facebook until um, the documentary came out and when we did Misfits, I thought, you know what, I'm going to set up my Instagram profile and I'm going to share my journey because my journey was about how I got diagnosed when I was 21, but how I'm actually still going through this journey of self-acceptance. So I am not, I like I, I look at you, Lee, with complete admiration and inspiration because um, I'm still not there and I'm very confident in saying that. So I, I, I'm in that journey now where I go out on weekends, I don't wear makeup. I'm a teacher, I work in a girls school, um, you know, I work in an environment with professionals and colleagues. I've started opening up about vitiligo a lot more. I delivered assemblies recently to all year groups about body image and self-acceptance. Um, I've come to that stage where I accept my skin for how it is and I've started to do that since the documentary. I've used 
used Instagram as a platform to raise the profile of Vitiligo and also highlight how I've overcome certain battles in my profession as working as a teacher in an all-girls school where body image is a big, big, um, it's a big part of society. I mean, social media plays a massive part in that. Um, so for me, Instagram has been a massive platform in sharing my journey. I've met some incredible individuals. I've met a few people today who've come to the um, Vitiligo Day, um, who I've met in person. It's been um, a really, really um, wonderful experience meeting them in person because we've kind of followed each other with Instagram. And, and I uh, as well felt incredibly isolated during the initial stages. Um, so for me, it's just been um, amazing to, to, to meet people alike and also to, to share my journey and inspire people and also to give them that hope and courage and confidence that they can hopefully get there too. So um, social media for me, social media is one of my main sources of income. Um, that's how I generate quite well, my, my rent. <laughs> that's what I have to do. Um, but for me, I started social media very early. It, it wasn't necessarily attached to Vitiligo, um, but it was something that I wanted to speak about. Um, and then I've done videos with like YouTube and I post about my Instagram, but it got to a point with me where I, I think I was about 15, 16, and it was like, there's more to me than just my skin. I wanted to live my life through my social media with having vitiligo. It's not necessary, it's something that defines me to the core of fact, but it's also something that isn't going to label me. It's something that I can still live an organic life. I can still do what I want to do. And I found social media to be very, very powerful, um, especially for the sense that I felt isolated when I grew up. I could, I, there wasn't really anyone for me to look up to. And then maybe about the ages of 13, and we all know her, like Winnie Harlow came on the scene, but there was still, I still f didn't feel a connection represented in media because she was a female that could cover it up if she wanted to. There was times that she couldn't. And I, it was something that I wanted. That's, how, that's why I sp how I speak and where I speak. It's something that I want to just demonstrate that you can just live your normal life to the best of your potential. And I think social media is such an amazing thing. It also always has this negative image, but it's brought us all together today. And I think that's really powerful. And I think it's something that if we continue to use it in the way that we do, more people like ourselves will feel included and we just learn more. So I think it's very, very important. Um, ever since about year seven, I've had Instagram. Didn't really use all the other stuff. It was easier not to. Um, but then I started getting the bullying for my vitiligo and this is when I hadn't met Brock and I still didn't really know that many people with vitiligo. So I couldn't reach out to them or anything. So I deleted all social media for about seven months. And I got it back um, in June when I met Brock and I became more vitiligo based around my Instagram. I still are. Um, I don't make posts about me on my bike with my mates wheeling down the street. I make posts um, about the modeling I did and everything. And I just think it's amazing to have it because when I first posted about my post with Brock, it made my life so much better for me because I still would cry every night <laughs> about having it. But I got comments from all people, you and you, about how amazing I looked. And it just really lightened everything for me. And it's got so much better at school, no bullying. Yeah. I don't know how I follow up from that. Uh, wow. Um, uh, with myself, uh, so I had social media, uh, just like my own personal account, uh, but I always covered up my vitiligo with makeup. Uh, it was provided from the British Red Cross. What I did in my first year of uni is I created a an account called the Vitiligo Man, but I never used it. It was just there. I was always conscious it was there. I never posted in it. Had friends like message me saying, this has just popped up on my Instagram. Like, what's this about? And I'm like, Oh no no it's nothing like ignore it for now, and then a, cu a couple of years later, um, like it brings you to like a journey of when I f finally accepted it, and 
I just remember a, a friend contacted me saying, let's do a, let's do a photo shoot. Uh, we did it. I went all the way to London, did a photo shoot, and then Brock, just like yourself, contacted me. And the next thing you know, it like exploded. And now, like with my social platform, it is like just mainly Instagram, but I use it again for like modeling, just like yourself. Uh, also, with, there's a lot of people going through like the same sort of journey, but it's a personal battle. So with these personal battles, like I, I find people messaging me from you know all around the world, and say like, and I know you've had it as well, Jyoti, and I'm sure you guys have it too, because people want the advice, like what do you do, how do you accept it, and where do you find your confidence from? But it is very much a personal battle, um, and I, I just remember like it was uh, last week uh, that someone messaged me uh, most recently, um, and about their vitiligo, and about relationships, and how unfortunately like her, uh, her boyfriend broke up with her because of her vitiligo and it's really harsh and that's you know that's not <sighs> vitiligo is there you know it's not to define your insecurities it's there to define your confidence and that's why it's brilliant like you know we're filled in this room now with people who, who are accepting it or on the verge of accepting it and that's something that you know together we're all promoting and it's it's great that you know we can get that and social media allows us to do that too So I guess my next question is around those difficult periods. So James has already hit on that, um, talking about his experiences at school. Um, so I guess there's always a period where it's difficult to have vitiligo. And for me personally, it was my teenage years. Um, you're incredibly emotional at that time. You're dealing with exam pressures. You're dealing with you know boyfriends and girlfriends and all that sort of thing. So for me, my teenage years were really hard because it was the one time when I wanted to fit in and I just could not fit in because my skin was just screaming at everybody. That's what it felt like. So I guess my question is, is what stage was, diffi was difficult for you when you had vitiligo? Was there a period, you know, uh, you know, in your 20s or your teenage years where you found having difficult, um, vitiligo particularly difficult? I think, um, I think my family will um, support me by saying this, but it's only the last um, three years that my life has changed. So um, I'm now 40 and um, it's only in the last three years that my life has changed. I would say that pr like vitiligo took over my life in my 20s and my 30s. It took over my life. It, it, def it did define me. It did. It, it, it made choices about my my career. Um, so before teaching, I was working in corporate banking in the city. I covered from head to toe. You know, we're in Canary Wharf. People are dressed to you know impress, and you felt this pressure to conform to that. You know, I felt that pressure to conform to that to be the city worker who was slick. You know, looking perfect. And I remember covering from my toe, my 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 finger, uh, my fingers to my toe with makeup it would take me two hours um, there wasn't anything as great as vitiligo glow I mean at that time there was like derma blend and I'd sit there patting my hands like this patting my hands my feet it would take me hours I'd go on a night out and um, you know when when we were when I was going out with my husband and I remember taking oh how long are you gonna take to get ready um, okay so you, you get ready at five I'll be I'll be um, you know and I'll be ready by eight you know kind of thing and it would take me two and a half hours to get ready and it really did take over my life I'd say for 20 years and I I feel really sad and, and when I talk and I do these body image assemblies to, to my students I tell them you know because I think like um, Lee said it's an umbrella of, um, you know, it's not just vitiligo. I think anything that's different, acne, psoriasis, you know, alopecia, all of these things that make us visually different, um, we can open this up to, to all kind of skin conditions. And I think that's where it does touch a lot of people. Um, and I know it touches touch my students when I talk to them because it's, it's things like acne and weight issues, all the things that make us different from other people. It's learning to accept yourself. I only started to learn to accept myself three years ago. Um, I have a young daughter of um, eight years old. I want her to see her mum as a confident, a confident young woman who's not just inspiring her students. I'm an inspiration to her. I have a son as well, and I want him to look at me as, you know, this is a strong mummy. I go and drop you at the school gates. I can see mum sometimes looking at me, but I have to... Um, you know, get to that point where I'm confident to, to be confident in myself, and I think I've reached that now. Um, a little bit too late, and that's the reason why I'm so passionate about my Instagram page, and I'm really passionate about what I do at school, not just teaching Spanish, but the body image as well, because I want people to learn to love themselves um, and not have to wait 20 years like I did. 
I totally, <laughs> everything you're saying, I totally hear, I totally hear. I think we can all associate ourselves with ha being quite a dark place with our skin. And I remember one of the earlier stages, I remember financially the pressure for us, me and my mother to get to London. I couldn't go on my own, I was a child. And there's not the same help in outer cities, like you can't get it. And then there's also the mental health attachments to it. So there's of course your body image and then there's also the feeling of insecurity. And I look back on it now and I think I was a child with depression and it's a hard thing to digest because no one wants to hear that. But how do you, how would you speak on that? And there's so many other things like the bullying. And then I went to camouflage classes, like you said, with the Red Cross. And great, that made me feel like I was blending. But then came the bullying from the skin to then why is this boy wearing makeup? And then it has all these other connotations attached to it that just cause damaging things. And I enjoyed school when I was there, but there were very, very dark times that I don't think it necessarily need to happen. And I don't think necessarily that would happen now. Um, I listen to my friends, younger brothers and sisters, and the way they speak is in a way with such intellect and compassion that I think it really, people like all of us in this room, the more that we talk about it, the more perceptions are changing across the board. Like the umbrella thing that you said, it's a really strong way for us. And I think if as long as you just know that what sorry, I just thought about something that my mum said. So there was this thing, she's like the bow and arrow effect. So you're gonna get pulled back and you're gonna get pulled back, but one day you'll shoot forward. And I think it's just holding on to that. And it, that just shot into my head now. And I feel like this is one of those moments where you think that all of those dark times, I'm really here right now. And I think it's just hold, look forward to the future. I think that's kind of stuff. Um. I've only really started accepting what I look like probably since the Brock L. Banks series. Um, it's made it easier, the fact that finally I've shown people, instead of always crying about it, shown them that vitiligo is going to be me for the rest of my life unless it goes away. Kids have finally realised what it actually is in my school and leave me be for it. Some people like it. Some people are like, oh, that's what Michael Jackson had. Oh, look at that. And I'm like, yeah, well done, finally, after two years. Um, that's pretty much it. I have one funny story. I, in year eight, when I wanted this to go away, I have it on the back of my head, like grey patches. And me and my mum thought it'd be an absolute great idea to put, I think it was mascara, like rub it on the back of my head. And it was going great, it went black, like my hair. And I'm sitting there in English, and my mate turns around and goes, James, why is the back of your hair blue? It had gone a dark navy blue colour. I absolutely ran out of that class, ran to the toilets and rubbed it off. I was like, no. <laughs> it's a great idea, Mum. Um, with myself, um, I didn't accept um, my vitiligo until last year, so that is, I don't know, six, seven years. My maths isn't great. Um, but, yeah, so with that, like, after about two years, I went to British Red Cross, covered it up, and I, like yourself, like, I thought, oh, you know, I'll be fine, I'll be blending it in. But I didn't know how to use makeup properly because I put it on, and I never used this the powder that sets it. All right, that's an amateur mistake because I thought oh, I'm doing it right here, but what actually happened is my skin will be like its normal colour uh, and then the makeup will be really shiny. So it, it, people would ask even more questions and then the questions then, which would be like, oh, did you get into a fight? Oh, what happened there? Like, and it would get even more attention that, do you know the same sort of attention that you'd even have with your vitiligo? But with last year, by, it was only by pure chance that um, I finally accepted it. I was on, like, I was on placement year. Uh, in London, I was staying at my girlfriend's flat uh, and I literally was following my normal routine to get ready. Um, I reached into my bag and realised, oh my God, like my, my makeup's not in there. Um, and that moment, I guess my heart sank. I was like, I can't go in, like I'm doing a placement year. I've got to impress so many people. It's a corporate company, you know, and there's so many new people who don't know who I really am. Um, after about like 10 minutes of a bit of a fight and then a motivational speech, you could say I finally plucked the courage to uh, to go in, uh, and that was the literally the first day of the rest of my life, and it completely changed my life.
because that didn't happen, I don't know if I'd be here right now with you guys as I am. So I've got a couple of individual questions for each of them because they've all done some amazing things in the, in the media. So my first question is for Jyoti, who um, recently starred in Misfits um, Like Us on BBC Three and is up for an NTA award, which is fantastic. So I just wanted to ask you about your experience with um, Misfits and how you found it. Um, I was really nervous when um, the opportunity came up to do the documentary because obviously I um, hadn't exposed my skin a lot at work. Um, I hadn't exposed it to a lot of family, um, and so I was nervous about people seeing me, like for me. So it was a massive step. Um, and I was worried, I was worried about being judged. Um, but then I think I sort of talked it through um, with, you know, my mum, my sister, my husband. I sort of talked it through, and I really spent a long time sort of deciding if it was the right step forward. But I actually felt mentally ready for it. There was something in my head that was, you know, because we spoke um, a few months prior to that, and I said, look, I'm, I remember speaking to you saying I've been part of the society for so long. You know, I think I'm ready to start talking about this. Um, so I decided to do the documentary. It was great um, to take part in the filming and to meet amazing people like, like Alec and, and the rest of the um, team. Um, and the experience did open my eyes up a lot. Like, I feel over the five days of filming, I just transformed as a person. And in an incredibly short space of time, it was just um, quite overwhelming. Because I met other individuals who'd gone through this journey um, and at different paces in their life, and different t they'd, come at, they'd accepted it at different points in their life. And so they were inspirational for me. Um, so, obviously, this was a massive, massive um, step for me to even just show my arms on, on TV. And they did put me under pressure. They said to me, um, you know, they did at one point, the producer, you know, can you come, can you come to the, can you come on shoot without makeup? I wasn't ready for it. And I kept having to drill it in. Look, this is part of my, this is a big step for me to do this um, documentary with just showing my arms and, you know, my neck and, and so forth. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's made me such um, a confident person. It's made me change who I am and I'm still going through that journey. Um, and I feel, I feel so empowered. I feel so empowered um, to, to everybody around me, um, to the people on my Instagram, to the children I teach at school, um, to, the, to, to my own children as well, that I'm a role model and this is me. I am confident in who I am and I'm getting there in my journey. Um, so, um, Alec is uh, an international model, um, if you follow him on Instagram, he's got a fair few thousand followers um, and he was also a misfits like us. So my question to Alec is, what's your experience been like um, in the modelling industry and how has your skin been accepted in the modelling industry? And sorry, we've only got about five minutes left because we've been busy chatting, so if we can just do a good, yeah, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> my career is very media based, I'm a model, I work in TV. Um, and we worked on Misfits Like Us, and I think, I don't, I, I just, I don't know, it's just, I've, the industry's always kind of accepted me, and I think it's because people pave the way for differences w in political senses and environmental senses and all that, and it all has a knock-on effect. And I think even if you just walk down the high street now, you'll see all sorts of different people in the campaign, and I'm just very proud to be able to present myself in the way that I do, quite unapologetically, and it's just a, I don't know, I've never felt a disrespect by the industry. I always feel like they've shown me in a good light and they've always allowed me to do projects in which not only highlight my skills, but also highlights Vitiligo. Yeah. <laughs> so Shankar was on the front cover of Conquer magazine, which you can see there looking um, Pretty dapper. Um, so I just wanted to ask you what your experiences was like doing that photo shoot and how that actually came about. Yeah, sure. uh, so with Conk Magazine, uh, brilliant magazine. I don't know if you've guys heard of it before, but it's written by survivors for survivors. So people like myself with vitiligo or have, who have other conditions or w as well, they write about their experiences in there and about how they're accepting it, ex sorry, accepting it or haven't accepted it. Uh, and what they're like looking to do. Uh, so with this particular issue, I got a message from Conquer when I was uh, on holiday 
uh, and we've been meshing each other throughout some time. And we met on Rebecca Violet's uh, fashion sh fashion show, which you were part of as well, actually. Um, and yeah, it just came about. They just meshed me, and uh, I went down to London, did a fantastic shoot. Um, and this one's called Growing Pains. Uh, and what it's basically talking about is people's journeys of what they go through, like the pain of it, but when, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, if you like, and how they've become to accept themselves as well. So it comes out in December, uh, at the end of December, just so you guys know. Um, yeah, that's it. Can you buy it online? Or? You can buy it online. You can pre-orders now. <laughs> Sorry. And James, so... Um, you've obviously been photographed by Brock, which is amazing, and you're also a model for Zebedee Management, did I get that right? Fantastic. So do you want to just share some of your campaigns that you've done before, maybe some of the fashion shoots that you've taken part in? Yeah. Um, I joined Zebedee only about like a week after having the photos done with Brock. Uh, I've done semi amount with them, they're quite an amazing agency, they got me a lot done. I think the favourite one I've done that's been brought through them is Ian Bodie in London and I was put into Hooligan magazine which was my first proper job and it was quite good. I met two young kids, one of them, Felix I think his name was, I spoke to him the most, he was an amazing person and it was just quite a fun day and showed me I do actually want to get far in this modelling thing. Thank you so, so much for coming today. It's an absolute honour to have you here. Um, it's been really insightful, a little bit emotional actually, just hearing some of your, you know, your experiences and your journeys that I'm sure resonate with a lot of you. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and yeah, our guest panel. <laughs>